Good morning. I would reiterate, uh, I do appreciate the prayers and, and the passing of Granny. And, but the thing is, I we in this moment now. Her race was won. She'd run it. But the Lord spoke there. And he was merciful. He was. And I think back to one of the verses the brother brought out that uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I know a lot of times people will quote that at a graveside. But even as the brother alluded to all those things David was feeling, it was just a glimpse just a small bit of what the Lord Jesus had to endure. Where he said he was compassed about by all those things, hell itself. But when it comes to those things, you to get to the Lord, there's got to be a death. And that preciousness that's in the sight of the Lord is when we die to ourselves. When we do take up our cross and fall after him. That is the preciousness. That is the beauty. Because what happens? You get more of Christ. You get more of Christ. But continue to remember one another, to pray for one another, to keep going. And that's what I pray today. That what we say will not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That He will help us even now. And I know that for the past few weeks and well, months even, it seems that I've told you to work out your own salvation. Well, I did. Well, the brother here exhorts you. I exhort you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Not just some idea or some thought. Well, I need Jesus. Yeah, you do. But to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And what the rest of that verse say going in there? For it is God that works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure, not of what we want to do, but it's His good pleasure. It's Him working in you. It's His Spirit. It's nothing that we can manufacture. It's nothing that we can do, but rely solely on the mercy of God, that He would be merciful to us. Where David couldn't go nobody, he did end up some that helped, but where did he end up getting his help from? from the Lord. And to go a step further, there was one that cried out and there was no help for him. Now it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But be thankful because he has risen. He is our high priest that we can cry out in our distress. And the God, Father, the thought that out of his nostrils, all that wrath, everything that was there, he will hear us. Not because of anything we've done. It's because of what Christ has done and that work that he delighted in there. If you will, flip over to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. And, and, and a while back, I'd, I'd referred to those things, you know, as far as working out our own salvation. There's a there's a progression in everything in life. But if we're not progressing, what are we doing? We're degressing. We're regressing. We're going the other direction. We're going the wrong way. It's like anything. I mean, you can play ball. You can get out there and go through the motions. As a coach said, practice is the least you can do when it comes to ball doing those routine things that you need to do, those fundamental things that you need to do, that's the least you can do. But it goes beyond just sitting there and saying, okay, I'm going to listen to this, I'm going to do it. No. It's realizing that if, if it wasn't for the Lord's mercy, we'd all be consumed. But let's look back there in Psalm 1 and look at this. This, this where we said there's a progression, there can be regression. In verse 1 it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Ah, you see him walking there. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, 
nor sitteth in the sea of the scornful. You notice how stagnant they get. It goes from it goes from not walking after that counsel of the ungodly. And then all of a sudden, whoa, he gets to standing still and starts listening to that counsel. But then what's he also doing? He's standing in the way of sinners, but he also ends up just sitting still. He becomes a scoffer. He becomes a mocker. We have to guard against those things. You say, I know, Brother John. No. The brother asked us the other day, ask your soul, where has it been? At the end of the day, where has your soul been? Is it progressing? Is it going toward the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that's your only hope? Or is it regressing, saying, I got this figured out? I'm going to stay stagnant right here because God's got it. I'm, I'm going to settle on my leaves because God's sovereign. He said, he, yeah, he is. But what are we to do? Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep on going, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the blessed man, right? And his law doth he meditate day and night. When there's light and there's darkness. He meditates it on both times. And he shall be like a tree planted. Who is this talking about right here? And he shall be planted like a tree. Be, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Who is the only man to believe that? Jesus. He is that blessed one. He is that holy one. Matter of fact, there's actually, a, and it came, it came to mind, but there's an old story. You remember over in Ezekiel? Matter of fact, flip over there in Ezekiel. Go past Jeremiah and what? Lamentations. Go to Ezekiel 47. And there's a picture of a progression here when it comes to a river. And I pray with Lord hope we'll see what this is right here. And as Brother Joseph, when he prayed a while ago, he was talking about we cannot comprehend, we do not understand. We cannot fathom, is the word he said, the depths of God's love. That we would enter into that place today that we'll get some glimpse of that, to see that. But I hope we see that right here, that we will be able to see the vastness. Well, I know we will never see it fully and clearly here, but we do get glimpses of it. But look here, Ezekiel 47, look at this, this here. Start at verse 1. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he at me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looked eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand, what's he measuring here, you think? What is he measuring? And it says, and he went forth eastward. He measured a thousand cubits. He went out there a good ways. I don't know exactly. I think, he, I think it's about a quarter of a mile or so. It says that he measured out a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters and the waters were to my ankles. A lot of times when it comes to God's love, that's about where most people hang out. That's where we like to hang out, right here in the kiddie pool. They had that old lake over, over at Laura Walker. They used to have a pool out there. You had the, the pool and the big old springy diving board, but then you had these little rather shallow but just to enjoy the moment. As, as one old preacher, he said, when you look at this story here, I, I, and he could be far off, and I'm like, Lord, help me. The, he, he said that, that those things, when it comes to the things of God, people are, that's how shallow it is. Because they still try to have their life. There is no death there. But look, look on down there in verse 4. It says, Again he measured another thousand and brought me through the waters, and this time the waters were to the knees. Again he measured another thousand and brought me through the waters, and they were to my lo the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. So we see, as the, br the brother alluded to, there, there is a vastness, there is a unfathomable amount of love that God has toward His children. But what do we do? We need to be progressing. As the more we die to ourselves, the more we progress. The more we think we have things figured out, 
we're regressing. We can't do it. It's only by His mercy. But keep going, verse 6. And He said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then He brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said He unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country. And where do they go from there? It says they go down into the desert. What is desert? Y'all smart enough to know. I think y'all did that in first grade or so, social studies. And if you don't, shame on your teachers, I guess. But what's a desert? Dry land. The brother said it himself. He's been some joyous times, but they've been a lot of dry times. Who controls the course of that river that flew out that, that flowed out of this place? This is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ right here. But do you have any control over that? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That the Lord would visit, because it is a desert. And go into the sea, which, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall, shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, what shall happen to it wherever that river flows? It shall live. It shall live. You think about a, a lot of times you'll sit there and you'll see the water, it'll, it'll raise and it's been, the, even the still has been flooded for a long time and that water will stay up in places and these little sloughs and bogs and stuff like that and them little bay swamps and stuff. And that water's there, but there's still water moving near it, right? But then all of a sudden when that water starts to, to, to recede, when the river starts to recede and that water's left behind, what happens to it? It dries up. It becomes stagnant, really. And if you ain't never been on a bog on a river, it starts to stink. And there ain't much life where you'll hear some old mud fish or something. You'll see a couple of turtles and things like that, but there ain't much life in it at all. You need that river to be moving. That river needs moving. And I can't think by help but what the Lord Jesus Christ, when He said, He said, He that believeth on me, as these scriptures have said, what? Out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Not a stagnation. Not a, not a walking with the ungodly, after counsel ungodly. Not just a standing in the way of the sinners. Not just sitting in those seats of the mockers. Not just staying there, but moving on. That river keeps moving on. Matter of fact, there's another river re reference right here in Revelation 22. Flip over there. Revelation 22. And, and, and it, I... It, it's sad, like the brother said, when he prays, or when we all of us pray, and the Lord answers the prayer. Again, he has to humble us there that we realize that there ain't nothing we can do. And there's nothing that happens outside of his will. But there are so many times that we do not think about God's love toward us, the vastness of it, the, the, how unfathomable it is for us to even think about it. But if you will, look there in uh, verse 1 in, in Revelation 22. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as what? Crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and to the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For who, who's the light of it? Who is it? For the Lord God, God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. There's a crystal river. There's a clear view of God that we will have one day. Right now, we see light and dark. We see light and dark. We see those things that come and it's like, Lord, it does become fearful. It does become fearful. But there was one that understood what God said. That the light and dark is the same to him, right? The light and the dark is the same. We get distracted when it gets dark. We got to think like, oh, what we got to do tomorrow? When tomorrow may not come. Think about what we need to be doing. Of course, when it gets dark, we become sleepy. Oh man, I just need to, I just need to rest. I'll, I'll be okay if I get some rest. 
How many times the Lord allowed that sometimes? He ain't going to let you rest. But, but He ain't the problem. It's us. He, he does that. The brother said that it seems like those that suffered most are the ones that close. Yeah. Why? Because they cry out and go to Him. Everything where everything's all right and everything's hunky-dory. How, how, how little do we focus on that love that He has for us that He would supply that need for our need of Him? You think about when things are going good for you, how things in the week are just running through so, so smoothly. And there may be some form of relief. There may be some tradition you may participate in, like, well, I'll pray to the Lord today. I mean, He did give me this day, didn't He? But that suffering is the very thing that leads us to God. And it does not have to always be. Yes, physical suffering. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but you'll be surprised what a man can live through. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly because, I mean, it, 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 when you think you're dead and gone, I mean, I don't know. I mean, his funeral arrangements or whatever. I mean, that, I, I wasn't kidding. I mean, Kim said I was looking off out like I was gone. And I thought I was gone, to be honest with you. There's things the Lord allow you to live through and go through that you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. If you will, turn over to Psalm 139. I referenced this just a second ago. But look in Psalm 139. It said, darkness and light are what? Both the same to him, isn't it? Let's pick up there in verse 1, Psalm 139, verse 1. Here's David. This is a Psalm of David. What, how could David write these things? He knows there's only one he could go to. The arm of flesh had failed him. But keep on looking at verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou hast searched me and known me. That's enough right there to make you think about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not, not, not those, the brother alluded to those faces years ago. He said, there's certain faces you give people. There's certain answers you give people. There's certain things you will tell your friends. There's certain things you'll tell your spouse. There's certain things you'll tell your coworkers. But there's one that searches and knows you. What is the intent? What are you doing? What am I doing? But keep going. Thou knowest my down sitting. He knows when you're sitting down. I mean, not, I mean, yeah, we could say literally, but he knows you're down sitting. And mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar so off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. How did he get there? How did he get there? To be able to say that. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, guess what? Thou art there. So regardless of wherever we may be, whatever, whatever we may be going through, the brother has been faithful to tell us that he's our harbinger. <laughs> I'll say it right for Sister Susan. But he's hard banging along. That's that river flowing. Even though it seems, hey, I, I can't help but, but think about it. it is, I can't even remember who said, I think it was Brother Barrett, but he, he said behind, behind that frown in Providence, behind them dark clouds, there's a smiling face because he loves us. Just as Mary and Martha was, they were concerned about Lazarus passing and saying, Lord, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have passed. And Jesus told him, he wasn't cold. He said, he said, I'm glad for your sakes I was not there. That sounded cold, didn't it? 
But what was it for? That God will be glorified. That Jesus would be exalted. That man would realize there ain't nothing you can do. Only the mercy of God will take you home. But keep on going there. Verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Why is that? Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the light shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Who is the only man to understand that? We can sit here and we can contemplate, we can comprehend, we can say those things. Well, to God, the dark and light is the same because He is that light. But who is the only man that saw that? The Lord Jesus Christ and all His sufferings. And he was, as, as Judas and them came out to Him while He was praying those, with those staves and sticks and whatever, and He looked, they were just bad actors. The Jews the whole time, the Pharisees have been accusing Him the whole time, over and over again. They were wanting to crucify him. The Romans did it, but they were just bad actors. But why? It wasn't the fact of what they did. It was the fact that a man was loving God so much and saw the love of God and wanted it to be shed abroad that he laid down his life. That's what it was. He laid down his life. They didn't take it. He told them, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. That's his glory to want what God wants. Have you ever did that? We're in the kiddie pool. We're ankle deep. We're ankle deep a lot of times, aren't we? We are. If we'll flip over to Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Psalm 36. David again right here, verse 7. If you look down, Psalm 36, verse 7. It said, if we believe on Jesus as the Scripture has said, what will happen? Out of our belly will flow rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit will be that teacher. That we'll be able to have the right thoughts toward God. That we'll be able to realize it in all humility. Like, we cannot do anything without you. We can't do anything but look here in verse 7. David realized here, How excellent is thy love and kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Y'all ever been outside on a hot day? And you, you realize like you stand out in the sun, it can make it any cooler. So what do you do? If you can't run back in the house, you don't want to go in the house, you're dirty. You've been working. What do you do? you probably go find you a shade tree. But right here, look here, where do we put, where does men put their trust? Under the what? Shadow of thy wings. A lot of times that shadow does seem fearful. But that's where our trust is. He's going to uphold us right there. Because what, what's, that, what's a mother hen do? She protects that way, don't she? And can them little chicks see what's going on all around them at that time? No. The Lord does that to His children. We may not understand it, but we have to trust Him there. Keep on going in verse 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For look right here, verse 9. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we do what? Shall we see light? And those dark clouds and providence, all those things that come against us, it seems like, whether it be those familiar to us, whether the, the main issue is that, that darkness that's within ourselves. That where He's searching, where He's trying, not trying, but trying us. It says, Thy light, in thy light we shall see light. That all these things that seem so dark, these things that do. Sometimes it seems like God hates us. You ever been there? If not, hold on. It's not fun. But when He appears and shows us the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did, and that love, 
We shall see light properly. We shall see it properly. Hey, flip, up, flip over to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. We talk about those things as far as what we see, what we understand a lot of times. But what must we do? We don't need to be like that swampland, do we? We don't need to be like that marsh. Like, well, there's water came through here. It eventually dries up, like the brother said. But if you will look over in Hebrews 10, verse 22, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. What is our, uh, what is our, what is our, what is our hearts to be sprinkled from? An evil conscience. How is that? There's another verse that says that it's not the putting away of filth of the flesh, but what? The answer of a good conscience. What is the only way that we're going to have a good conscience in things? It's for it to be sprinkled. Sprinkled with what? None other than the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he, what he did. That's where God the Father delights. But not only does our hearts need to be sprinkled from evil conscience, our bodies need to be washed with what? Pure water. There's that water rushing through. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And here let us encourage each other as we go right here, right? And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. What are the good works? What is it to do the works of God? But to believe on him who he has sent. That's where we need to provoke. Believe on him that he has sent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Regardless of how dark it is, whatever you may be going through, whatever God and his providence is bringing, that harbanger going before you. Whatever he has done, let us provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaken this in ourselves. That's what I pray that, Lord, this morning, that we not forsaken this in ourselves. Not just getting to get, well, Brother Mike's gone. It's all over now. But look, it took him leaving for Brother Harold to come back. <laughs> I, I did mess up the other day. Uh, a brother was saying, that I'm going out of town, you, you preaching. I was like, okay, okay. And then he, he said it again to me. He's like, I, I just hadn't been, you know, we're going to go to, I said, I, said, <laughs> I said, go ahead and justify yourself, brother. But guess what was happening all this week? Guess who was justifying herself? Trying to. So don't, never mind, don't say stuff to people. The brother said, be careful what you pray. Don't even, I just, you better have blinders on because you'll be surprised what you'll blurt out. Not maybe, well, you'll be surprised what you blurt out sometimes. But all that that you're thinking, that the Lord sees where that light's shining in that dark place. But keep on not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. There it is, building each other up. Like, and does that mean i got to call you every single day and tell you, hey, keep going? No, I better go to that one, the Lord Jesus Christ. I better go to him and say, for this one, for your children. And Lord, for those that don't know you. But then we start praying for our enemies because you see how merciful he was to us. You start praying for them. Like, Lord, say, be merciful. But we exhort one another, and so much the more... Uh-oh, we need to be progressing, don't we? It says, so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, therefore remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. We don't need to trodden that underfoot what the Son of God has done. And the very thing is that we're sanctified with the blood of the covenant. That's what we need to have our hearts sprinkled with from an evil conscience. We have to. We have to. We, uh, earlier we alluded to that, that that river flowed through the desert, right? In Ezekiel. 
We flow through the desert. If you sit there and you honestly, and as the brother said, ask your soul, ask, ask yourself. And then all of a sudden, you realize you deceive yourself in it. You say, Lord, you show me that true light that you come in and reveal those things. Search me and try me. Because he that doeth truth does what? Cometh to the light. But why? That his deeds be wrought in God. That God did, that it was God who works in you to will and to do. Not a form of God that's denying the power, but the very, God, the very power that God gives through his Holy Spirit. Not just to teach, not just to comfort, but to what? Even to convince you of sin. It's all those things. It's all those things. Matter of fact, flip over to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. We are that desert. We are the ones that's distracted. We are the ones that's sleepy. I think the brother talked about the other day, them ten virgins, how many of them were sleepy? All of them were, weren't they? Did all of them have oil? They didn't. What about their wicks? Had they trimmed their lamps? Well, God's did this. That's it. He's given this. No, we better trim them wicks. Trim them wicks. But look right here, uh, Hebrews 2, verse 1. It says, therefore, we got to be careful, don't we? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Why do we need to be careful what things we've heard? Lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense for reward. Who's he asking this to right here? Verse 3. How shall we? Not how shall they. Not shall how all these, these bad people. How should everybody else? But what? How shall we? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, are we getting sta are we standing in the council of ungodly? Or standing in the way of sinners? Are we are we going to sit down and be a scoffer and mocker at what God has done? Are we going to neglect so great a salvation? Are we going are we just going to be in there in the kiddie pool? We better go with that word right there. Go with him. So how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation when it first began to be spoken by who? The Lord and was conformed to, confirmed unto us by them that heard him. There is an example. There is an example in John. Matter of fact, flip over to John. You remember the, the, the blind man? Some people said they didn't think he had any eyeballs. I think that was the one. This may not even be the right one. But in John 9, there was a, there was a blind man. And you figure in verse 1, and Jesus starts passing by his way. We'll, we'll, we'll read it. Matter of fact, go right here, John 9. And it's, it says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And look, you, you ever... <laughs> People go through stuff sometimes. I know that... Uh, and you'll wonder, like, what in the world did they do wrong? And the brother said, what did I do wrong? The question, one of, one of these brothers told me one time, what have you done right? What have you ever done right? Because there's only one thing he owes us. There's only one thing he owes us. And that's hell, and he could pass off at any moment. But keep going there, he says, and his disciples asked him, sounds like us right here, don't it, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You, we got to blame those around. Yep, if my mom and daddy, if they'd have acted better, if they'd have raised me better, I wouldn't have all these problems. Right? Oh, it's not a good time to laugh, Morgan. <laughs> But that's what they asked. Who did sin? Who did sin? 
Was it the man? Was it his parents? Is this what caused him to be born blind? But look at this love right here. Look at this right here. And Jesus answered and said, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Was Jesus lying? When it came to this blindness, no. What was the reason why the man was born blind? Look right here. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Whenever the gospel is going forth, whenever whether it's devotion, whether it's the preaching, whatever it may be, you listen to a, 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 a message on the road looking at your laptop, whatever it is, I pray for you and for myself when this happens, that the works of God will be manifest in us. And again, what is the works of God? Believing on Him who He has sent. What was Jesus set, knowing what was about to happen? He said it wasn't the fact that they were born blind, but that the works of God should be made manifest in Him. Jesus says, I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. Why? Because He says, I am the light of the world. But what happens right here, the night cometh when no man can work. Why? Because that one was becoming our sin. And it was dark. And all those things that David was describing was, of course, that day, great day of wrath and judgment that God poured out on his son. But he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle, and he anointed his eyes, and the blind man with the clay. <laughs> we, that's what we can do. We'll see how this works. We'll see where our faith is. We'll just sit there and we'll throw dirt in each other's eyes, right? This man was blind. And I if he didn't have eyeballs, I know what the Lord Jesus was doing. The very word of God, that dirt we're made out of, he was making him some eyeballs. I could be wrong, but, I, I, but that don't matter. That don't matter. Let's keep going. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And when he sent him, what did he do? He went, didn't he? He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. What does it take? Uh, as Keaton, I, I don't know if he hustles or not. Has, has he ever intentionally took clay on the ground and just rubbed it in his, on his pants? You ever did that? And rub it on your shirt, act like you slid in head first, on your pants and everything. You ever, you ever did that? After working in the yard or doing any kind of working on a changing the oil in something, is your clothes clean? What does it honestly require for them to be washed? Just water sitting still? You can soak stuff, yes. You can soak stuff. But it takes some agitation, don't it? It takes some movement. Of course, back in the day, when they didn't have electricity, they had them old scrub boards, didn't they? Go down the water and they'd scrub it, get it clean. It was always embarrassing if, you didn't, if your baseball uniform was always white. Your mom, hey, they'd try to bleach them. Well, if your white pants, of course, that'd work a lot of times. All your other jerseys, different colors. Look at there, I still got that clay on me. But washing takes movement of water. Not just sitting there saying, I got this figured out. Lord, be merciful to me. Go to Him. Go to Him. But they go, he, he goes and went, and of course, what happens? They sit there and say, well, golly, this ain't that same guy. They start making excuses, right? They start saying things, this ain't even Him. I, I, he was a beggar. But this, this ain't Him. Matter of fact, we need to we need to go. We need to go find his parents. We we need to ask them. And they even matter of fact, the Pharisees said that Jesus wasn't. A, matter verse sixteen said this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. They had done set up and got still in their religion and saying this is what you got to do to please God. But Jesus was wrecking all that. He was wrecking all that. And they go and they keep on and they ask him, of course, and everything. But if you hey, skip on down there to verse 20, verse 20. And it says, his parents answered them. What well, they asked him, verse 19, they asked him saying, Is this your son who ye say, who ye say was born blind? 
How then does he see now? His parents answered them and said, we know, not this, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. So they, they affirmed where they were doubting, like, oh, was he really blind? They sit there and tell him that, but going on, go on down to verse 20. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Why didn't they know? Unbelief. Unbelief. That's exactly right. Unbelief. It says, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes? They didn't know the Lord Jesus either, what he had done, right? We know not. He's of age, ask him. He shall speak up for himself. These words spake his parents because they did what? They feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that Jesus was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. They was more worried about their religion and being receiving honor of men than they were the honor of God. And that is a strong delusion. That is unbelief. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Talking about Jesus again. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he do? What, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? And son, you know he got him right here. Will ye also be his disciples? Good question. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Oh, we're going to do something. We're going to keep that law to please God. When there's only one that did it. We know that God spoke unto Moses, but as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Uh-oh, there's that whence word. We don't know where he's from. Why? Because he told them later. He said, y'all from beneath, I'm from above. He told them. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened, his, opened my eyes. He said, you don't know where he's from, but he's opened my eyes. It wasn't that he was putting him in his place. He was just telling the truth, wasn't he? I was blind. But now I see. What had Jesus said earlier? It wasn't this, this man. It wasn't his parents that sinned. But it was for what? That the works of God should be manifest in him. You have all that story there, yes. But what does it ultimately come down to? That the works of God should be manifest in him. That he would believe on the one that he has sent. Because Jesus asked him in verse 35, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And, and what that belief lead to? And he worshipped. It led to worship. It wasn't, it wasn't just a stagnant of, hey, I, I believe what the Lord's done. There's worship. Being thankful. How little do we do? How little does this one standing before you do it? I'm the worst of the lot when it comes to this right here. To be thankful. To be thankful. Matter of fact, if you will, flip over to Romans 2. Romans 2. Uh, Brother Clay, I, mean, I remember uh, when somebody would say, or somebody else would do it, uh, God is good. All the time. And then somebody else, all the time, what? God is good. <laughs> How many times have you thought when that light shining in there like you wonder if this is being good, but then hey, our light, that light the way we see is his light. When we get there, we'll see how good he is to us. We'll see how good he is to us in them these dark things. Romans two. Romans two. Oh man, I, I, did, I did not want to read this. You want to skip it? 
Why do we turn here? Uh, let's look. No, I'm serious. <laughs> look. Therefore, thou art, art what? Inexcusable old man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for when thou, wherein thou judgest another. What are we doing when we judge another? Thou condemnest thyself. But they're bad people. Has that light shined in your heart? Well, I know Jesus loves me. Kitty pool. Ankle deep. I'm, I'm like, brother said, like a thimble, maybe. Man, it's, it's crazy, isn't it, what we know? For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to what? Truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance? Remember, hey, not trampling that underfoot, right? Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Those dark times, those times in Providence, that, time, that desert time when it's really dry, it's God's goodness to you that you realize you can do nothing without Him. And without His mercy, we're all lost. We're all lost and undone. But it is His goodness that leads us to, to repentance, true repentance. And as, as we're getting ready to close here, if you, if you will, flip over to Titus. Titus 3. Titus 3. I always, uh, someone always told me, don't you, don't you buy a dark, big, a black truck, which I haven't, but is it, it, why would somebody tell you not to buy a black truck or black car? Because when you go to, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, when you go to wash it, what happens? If you miss one spot, what happens? It shows. It shows. It shows. Washing requires, mo it requires something moving. Maybe something agitating it. It just can't sit still. It's like, oh, <laughs> your truck's all muddy and you spray a little bit of water on it. Yep, that looks good. It's cleaned up. No, but let's look right here in Titus 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every, uh-oh, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also, there it is, that's why we can't be, if we judge another, we're condemning ourselves. Look right here. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But look what happens, verse 4. But after that, the good, after the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared. And here it is, His mercy. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. They are filthy rags, any of our righteousness. But according to His mercy, He saved us. By the what? Washing of regeneration. What is that? To regenerate something is to do what? To bring it back live. That your soul is to live toward God. That He is washing. That that is a regeneration. Not that you're... Be I believe the Lord has delivered us. I believe that right now He is delivering us. And I pray by the mercy of God, He will deliver us. That He has washed, He is washing, and that He will take us home. That He will. But it's not by righteousness we have done, but according to His mercy He has saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Not just ever so often, but he says affirm these constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful for what? 
Well, God's did it all, Brother John. We, we know that. What's it say here? That we might be careful to maintain good works. And we've said it a couple times already today. What is good works? What is true good works? To believe on Him that He has sent. Even if it's in darkness. Even if it's in light. Even if it's on the mountaintop. But more than likely, it's going to be in the valley. There's one said it. <laughs> there's... There's, there's that, that mountaintop ain't always the experience you need because there's usually one up there with you that's got you lifted up there. But to get low to that valley. Because you can't grow nothing on that mountaintop. It's rocky. Down that valley, that's where the fruit grows. That's where it grows. But it says that we might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to all men. And all men. As we close, flip back over there to Ezekiel, back to that story, that river. I have to warn all of us, I have to warn myself. And I've made mention to swampy land, water that's stagnant, water that's not moving. But let's look back there in Ezekiel 47. Look there in verse 11. Lord help us right here. Look here. 47 verse 11. But the miry places, those swampy places, but the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. What happens? A little bit of salt. It's good, right? Too much salt. We're ruining things. I think we talked about that a while, a while back, about us being the salt of the earth too as well. Right? But it can stunt growth too. Salt can be used for multiple things, can't it? But right here it's saying that, hey, these miry places, they're not going to be healed. But finish up in verse 12 right here. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his month, because their waters they issue out of the what? Sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. He that is whole does not need a physician, but rather he that is sick. Always go to the Lord Jesus Christ, because until we get home, He's the only one that can deliver us. He is your only hope. He is our only help. And I pray you bless your soul this morning.